and we're recording. Perfect. Okay. Welcome to episode five of Core Talk, the Norfolk District's official podcast. I'm your host, Patrick, and with me via an interesting connection in these times is... Andy, your other host. So how you doing, Patrick? I'm doing well. I'm actually wanting to know how you're doing, and did you miss me last time? <laughs> I did. I did. It was it was really interesting. And, you know, I love me some me, but that was a little a uh, bit of an Andy heavy episode last time. But yes, you were missed. Yeah. And the, one of the reasons why I was not around was obviously I was, you know, in the throes of uh, going around the state with our alternate care uh, site assessment teams um, and gathering the information with them and posting all those photos and and uh Got, obviously did that interview too last month, but uh, that was uh, it was an interesting time, and then we continue to be in interesting times as we uh, we move forward. And we're still in uh, a very much telework position. Um, I did venture into the office the other day. I can tell you that the dust is uh, piling up on our cubicles. <laughs> But, you know, we're getting it done. I mean, I, I know you've been able to get, get work done at uh, your house with uh, with the uh, the home office setup. I've been doing the same here, and uh, as has the rest of the staff. And I think that's a lot of what our listeners are experiencing, too. It's where, where do we go now? And I think, I, I don't want to speak for all of our listeners, but I know here in my house, it's, well, what next? kind of compare it to like the caterpillar it's going to turn into a butterfly but it's in that weird chrys chry chrysalis chrysalis stage right now so i feel like that's kind of where we're at we're waiting to just spread our wings after this and see uh you know what the normal looks like if we ever hit a normal again or we'll hit a normal again but it won't be i think like what we had before there'll definitely be some modifications I like that you said that. Uh, I did a, a segment with our uh, navigation support and survey uh, team. They actually super, you know, awesome group of people. But through all of this, some of the modifications that they have had to make um, to follow the COVID-19 criteria were actually really positive. And they're looking forward to implementing them as things kind of roll back into whatever normal looks like. Yeah, that, that's awesome because uh, you know, I know that they are out in the field. They they tend to be in um, uh, some some tight corridors on their vessels and stuff like that. So um, I, th I think this actually uh, afforded an opportunity to take a real hard look of how are we doing business and what can we do to improve on um, employee safety as well as efficiencies. And I think that uh, that across the district and a lot of workplaces throughout the the United States that's that's gone down. And that includes our, our crews who are um, not just in the navigation folks, but um, this being the month of May, we have Memorial Day coming up, and uh, we do a lot of work for Arlington National Cemetery, and our crews there have had to uh, adjust how they do things. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely have, uh, I got a chance to sit down with our program manager and uh, to talk about uh, what's going on up there, what the work we're doing, and, and how they're adjusting as well. So, um, I guess right now let's let let's uh, you know Andy. I think we're gonna you know start with uh, your piece. All right, let's kick it off. So um, I'm here with Scott Titus and Dennis Barnes, and we're gonna find out a little bit about their role in the Norfolk District Mission, and um, also how that's been impacted by um, by COVID nineteen. So um, Scott, why don't you start us off? Tell us a little bit um, about who you are and, and what you do. Sure. I'm the port engineer in the navigation support and survey section as part of the operations branch in the water resources division. So we work with hydrographic and topographic survey teams and also do debris collection and some light marine construction. Okay. Uh, Dennis, how about you? Tell us you know, a little bit about you and, and what it is that you do. Uh, my name is Dennis Barnes. I'm with Navigation Support and Survey Section, Master Crane Operator and Relief Captain, and uh, we're kind of in charge of the bigger vessels for debris removal, hazards navigation. We do piers, dock, bulkhead construction throughout the core, environmental sampling. Um, I'm also the alternate district dive coordinator for Norfolk District, so I handle a lot of the dive inspections for our construction projects around the core. 
So um, where would people, like, where do you guys usually work? Where would, where would people in the community see you guys? Um, they see us all up and down the waterway through, you know, southeastern Virginia. My main office is in Chesapeake, a Great Bridge Reservation office. Um, we work all the way down toward Elizabeth City, North Carolina, all the way up the eastern shore toward Maryland, uh, middle to the upper Chesapeake Bay, James River to Richmond. Um, we're kind of all over wherever the need need is is where we go. And, and you guys were up in Philadelphia not too long ago, correct? Yes, ma'am. We uh. They had some debris removal issues in their federal channels up there, and they don't have a debris program or a larger vessel, and they were going to have to issue a contract to uh, facilitate the removal of their hazards navigations right in the middle of their federal channel. And uh, we uh, were contacted by some of their survey personnel, and of course, you know, helping a sister district, we jumped on the opportunity and. Uh, we were actually more successful than we had initially set out that we, we thought we would be, and uh, they were pleasantly surprised, so now they're trying to uh, schedule us on a normal basis to come up there with some of their hazard navigation removal. Oh, that's very cool. It's nice to be wanted and appreciated. <laughs> yes, it is. So um, how do the jobs come down? Like, how does it work? Somebody in the community says, hey, we have an issue, or is it you know, the city, how do, how do, how does the work flow down? It, it's actually kind of several, several factors. Uh, local municipalities, city or state government finds an issue on a waterway and they'll contact the core. A lot of it is, um, personal, you know, uh, just citizens see something and they say something and call and they call a project manager or you know any of our employees are out whether it be regulatory or construction and they see an issue and then they pass it on to us and of course we got to do a site visit, visit and an assessment to see if we can uh, take care of the issue for them and so scott like what kind of stuff do you guys handle and what kind of stuff is not um the responsibility of the the district that's a great question so um the Federal jurisdiction or the Corps' interest as far as navigation goes is with uh, what have been designated as federal navigation channels. Back in the late 1800s in the Rivers and Harbors Act, these federal navigation channels were designated. Uh, it may or may not include waterways that one might think has a federal navigation channel. So the simple ones are the, the big shipping channels. So where you see Navy ships or container ships going, those are probably federal channels. But it, it also includes some considerably smaller waterways. If there were commercial uh, interests on the waterways a hundred and some years ago, uh, they may have been designated as a federal waterway. So we have, as uh, Dennis alluded to, a hazards and navigation hotline phone number that um, citizens can call. We're also in contact regularly with our port partners, so the Coast Guard, Navy, NOAA, um, Virginia Pilots and Maryland Pilots Association communicate with us regularly. Tug captains often will call and, and let us know that there are extra sets of eyes out there for us. Uh, but whether we get a call from a citizen or from one of the port partners, the first thing we'll do is, is assess its impact on the federal navigation channel. And if there is one, we'll dispatch uh, resources out there to take care of it. And if it's not, we'll attempt to, to put the concerned party in contact with the right agency, whether it be a state or local jurisdiction. So let's take this scenario. Concerned citizen calls, and there is something that's in uh, a federal waterway. Um, walk me through the steps of how that is handled from start to finish in the pre-COVID-19 world. So there's, when we talk about uh, hazards in the federal channel, there's two subcategories that we would consider. One is referred to as drift or floating debris. The second is uh, what we call obstructive deposits. So think something larger. It could be anything from an anchor from a buoy to a sunk, sunken object, a sunken boat. So depending on the type of hazard, 
that's encountered. What we'll do is we'll take down the location, uh, verify that it is indeed an impact or a potential impact on a federal channel, and then we'll look at the resources that we have available and what the potential risk is to either the channel or to the boats that are out on the waterway, and we'll dispatch those resources according to that risk. So that's a long-winded way of saying uh, there are some things that require immediate attention and some things that require resources that take a little bit of time to, to spin up and get together. So smaller drift uh, reports, as you mentioned, in pre-COVID times, we, we have a patrol boat out five days a week during daylight hours looking for these kind of hazards. And then as we get a report in, they would dispatch to the site of that reported drifting hazard and remove it. Um, some of the bigger objects will require coordination. Uh, we'd have to, for example, say bring the Elizabeth up from Chesapeake, and they, they'd need some time to, to get their rigging and things together. But we, in that case, would coordinate with the Coast Guard. They would put out a local notice to mariners and broadcast that, that there's a, an obstruction in the waterway until such time that we could get out there and verify it and remove it. And... So, Dennis, like, what, what is now? Tell us a little about your role let, using this scenario that we were talking about. Um, as Scott said, you know, a lot of the times he'll receive the call and then he'll confer with me. And sometimes we might have to ride out there and look at it and see what is needed to remove it, um, depending on where it is and location and the depth of water and whatnot. You know, if we have to get divers in, of course, we use contract divers. And then, of course, all the paperwork follows with that. And we try to get as much description on the removal as possible, um, whether it be a sunk log or, as Scott said, a, you know, a buoy sinker, an anchor, or a sunk vessel. And, you know, then we go through all the procedures for removal to, you know, to make sure that we've got our bases covered, notice to mariners, uh, proper rigging. And uh, it's it's actually a, a big cumulative effort of a lot of different parties. Our survey team will, you know, side scan by it or multi-beam it to give us more description of what it is and the location of it, especially if it's in one of the deeper federal channels. Yeah, it sounds like, I mean, there's a lot of creative thinking and flexibility and coordination, a big team effort to get this job done. Yes, it is. And, you know, we live in a fluid environment. The tide goes in and the tide goes out, and it's never the same each time it goes in or out. And I've never in 30 years, 31 years of working on hazards navigation, I don't think we've ever had two that were identically the same. What was, and this is like a side question, I'm just curious, what was the coolest or most, most interesting or, or shocking um, item you've ever pulled up? Um, it was actually not in Norfolk District. It was Delaware River for uh, Philadelphia District. Uh, it was an old Army bridge boat from probably the 1940s era and it was upside down right in the middle of the federal channel and it was only protruding into the project depth a few inches so no one ever really messed with it but we were in that area removing objects that were more into the project depth and once we got it it was roughly a 24 foot steel hull army bridge boat and it still had the engine and everything in it so that was pretty neat looking at the history of the army removing an army vessel you know and, and being a, a philadelphian myself kind of not surprised that's something you'd find in philly um of all places how have you adapted to, to to the different way we have to operate now oh i can answer that one very well when the covid first started hitting several months ago and all of the safety protocol was put in place we were actually just starting to reinstall the lock gates at South Mills. And there was a lot of entities involved, and that's when the social distancing came to light in the PPE. So like with that project, I mean, we had the prime contractor, you know, which is in charge of the maintenance and the repair of the lock gates. And then we had the crane company that was hired by the prime contractor to come in and set the gates. Then we had you know, a subcontractor dive company, and then myself and the other QA people and, and PMs from the core. So it was a, a unique dynamic with the social distancing, you know, because we have to have a, a, a group meeting of safety, and it, it was kind of unique dynamics with the social distancing across this huge field where 
everybody separated and you know it was it was a little different with you know most people sign the safety protocol sheets the activity hazard analysis and we we did a check off sheet instead of each person having to touch the pen and paper we did a roll call basically and the uh the site safety health officer did a check off and as they called their name to make sure they were there um so we were kind of spread out and with you know the dive team they were segregated from the crane company the crane company was segregated from the prime contractor that was responsible for the installation of the swing arms on the gates so it was it was minimal impact but it was just a different dynamic you know you guys are working in close um, space to each other to get the work done but also your team is very close and in general just because you are such a great team you guys are you know our friends so tell me about that the social aspect it's been kind of i'm going to say rough it, it's such a different world at this time you know with a, we're split up into several different teams and of course with the social distancing and the wearing PPE to, to get close together to do it. it. It's actually, it's taken a strain on some of the things that we do, but as far as the mission, it, it really hasn't affected the mission a whole lot. But like you said, the social aspect of it, you know, we kind of miss each other because we are, we've been working together longer than some of us have been, you know, married to our significant <laughs> others. So it, is, it is like a, uh, you know, I guess we're uh, the, uh, Having separation anxiety a little bit, I guess. <laughs> it's a, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me with the, with the with your guys. For you, how have things changed for you um, uh, since COVID nineteen? Um, for me, it's a little different, you know, on a social and a professional. You know, my my parents are older, so I haven't got to see them like I used to, and. You know, as, as far as work goes, we, you know, our team, we're, we're ready to, to get it done. And um, I guess we're all just ready for it to kind of get back to what's going to be our normal. But that, that's pretty much it for us, you know. Yeah, yeah. So has there, has there been anything, um, any takeaways from modifying how the work is getting done that we're, we're good or we're positive? Um, there's actually, you know, quite a few different aspects in that, you know, and with us working on different schedules and at different portions and times, it, it kind of spreads around a little more for people to try and accomplish more of their tasks without so much supervision over their shoulder. And We've really seen some shining stars come out of this, you know. Most of the time when you're in a group of six or seven people and you've got one or two making the decisions, with us kind of separated like we are, you kind of see people taking more responsibility on and some of the things they do just kind of makes you sit back and go, you know what, this mission is going to carry on for years to come. So you kind of opened up opportunities for for some people to, uh, you know, try their try their hand at, at leadership and supervisory roles, huh? Yeah. Oh, yes. By all means. And, you know, we like I say, I think this mission will carry on years after I'm gone for sure. So who who has stepped up? Who has really just been been that shining star for you guys? Um, Eric Shear is one of them. You know, he's a, our crane, newest crane operator, and uh, he's been here about 12 or 13 years. And I've kind of been mentoring him as a crane operator and kind of letting him, Scott and myself, have kind of been letting him take the lead on a few of these projects on, you know, looking at them, estimating them, and coming up with solutions for the problems. And, you know, I, I'm thoroughly impressed with, with the way he is carrying this prep project on. That's great. That's great. I mean, it, and I keep referring back to being able to watch you guys actually work and watch you guys in action. It is, it's that choreographed chaos but every i mean you guys are so in tune to what needs to be done and how to do it it's uh it's really impressive so to hear that you're you're um you're readying the next generation to do that that's that's great to hear and and scott how about you on your end um on a supervisory end how have things been been different probably the most glaring difference is operating in a remote environment so 
My current office is about 56 miles away from the district headquarters and probably about 70 miles away from Great Bridge. So the requirement to assist the teams from such a distance is, is added a new aspect to it. And also the, the communication flow, while it's still happening, it's different. You know, when we're face to face and we've got regular interaction throughout the day, um, I think one of the things I've realized recently is I, I took a lot of that communication for granted. Uh, one of the things that, that I realized with a recent conversation is that where in the normal environment, when we're all in close physical proximity to each other, the crews see a lot more of the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. But with the remoteness, um, there are a lot of conversations that happen out of sight of a lot of the other crew members. Mm -hmm. So I think, like I said, I took that for granted before and, and learned that lesson just in the last couple of weeks to, to recognize that, you know, where I might make a simple sounding statement that makes a lot of sense to me because I've been involved in all of the conversation uh, may not make a whole lot of sense or translate well to the crew um, because they haven't been a party to all the other conversations that have been happening in the background. So one of the things I, you know, think we need to work on is, as managers is ensuring that we uh, broaden the communications over what we normally would conduct when we're all in the same place at the same time. That's interesting. You know, remaining cognizant of what, what people's knowledge base is in, in, in conversations and where people are coming from and what they were you know, privy to prior to coming in that com That's kind of adding another layer of just thought behind, um, you know, we go out and reach out and, and, and say something. So that, that's kind of interesting. How do you see that carrying over into whatever is going to become our new normal? So one of the things that we've instituted over the last month or so is uh, I, they're not really meetings, but, you know, conversation sessions with the team that, uh, again, when we're all around each other all the time, we kind of go on with, with business as usual and don't set us I hadn't previously set aside I think enough we we did get together for team meetings and everything periodically but I don't think there was enough of it so we have some coordination meetings now what we have one a week with the entire uh, team and then we have more frequent conversation with the individual units working units so um, with the, the survey boat captains in Norfolk, we'll have one meeting. I'll have another meeting with the, the maintenance team and then another meeting with, with Great Bridge. And because, because of this new normal, we've had to change our communication model. And I think there are a lot of benefits to that that I think will translate back when we go back to our new normal. So not meetings for meetings sake, but um, kind of uh, accepting some of the way this new dialogue has happened. Mm -hmm. And the way that the, the units feed information to me and carrying that forward into the way we do business in the future. That's so cool. See, I love the can positivity. I interject, can I interject something here? You can. When I first came to work for the Corps of Engineers on the back dock in Navigation Support and Survey section, we used to document our time in a three-ring binder with a pencil. <laughs> we did not have computers. We had an old typewriter for filling out a requisition to purchase items with and this new technology with what we're dealing with now I can't believe how open the communication line is actually has gotten you know as Scott said in the last month or two the technology's working I mean we're there at each other's fingertips we can face to face we can look at each other's expressions when we're talking about a project and go do you think this will work and it's actually, in my opinion, it's you know, I think I think this national crisis has actually improved our communications. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. and one you did date yourself there a little bit, Dennis. <laughs> it's like you know, yeah, just a little Den bit. Dennis brought up um, you know computers and the technology that we're using here, and and I think that was another big hurdle, folks, throughout the district, and I know specifically in in our section have overcome and um, real proud of the whole team for remaining flexible. But uh, by the nature of their work, our, our crews, uh, it does their, their work doesn't necessarily lend to remote work as well as say mine does. When the social distancing requirements came out, the 
the crews had to get creative with with staying occupied. We switched from our normal operational tempo to a focus on what project managers consider uh, mission essential work. So the crews were asked to first uh, adopt a, a minimum manning posture. To oversimplify it, we, we, we split up into two teams, an, an A team and a B team, just to allow the crews more physical uh, distance between each other because there weren't so many people around at any given time. And the result of that was that we can't do as much work as we did before. Uh, the, the crews, when they, they weren't on their on week or, or on the vessel, uh, had to come up with some other things to do. And we've had some of the team members go out and, and really track down some opportunities for worthwhile, valuable training um, that could be conducted away from the office. So they've been they've been focused on some OSHA training and taking care of some you know the the typical annual re requirements that come from yeah. the workplace, but also some really valuable training that we wouldn't have taken the time to do had we not been forced into this environment. Uh, so you know we're uh, another. Positive is we're going to come away because of the work of some of the crew members and going out and finding that training and tracking it down and figuring out how to get signed up for it. Uh, we're going to come away, you know, better trained and, and more equipped to do our job when we come back to normal. Yeah, I think it, I, I think it's caused all of us to kind of slow down a little bit and and look at what we're spending our time on and make sure that you know we're we're, we're conducting you know that that valuable training and we're doing things that maybe we would have would have gotten pushed to the side um before because we were you know so so busy and and but yeah that's awesome um so we do have some positives coming out of out of this whole situation <laughs> excellent um is there anything um as, and i asked dennis you know who was the shining star for him so scott who do you think um would you like to kind of shout out um that you you know you've seen do a, you know really great work or has really stepped up during this whole crisis. Answer that probably contrary to how, what you were expecting. I I'm I can't single anybody out. The entire team has impressed me to no end. They've you know we talked before all this happened. You know we we talk about staying flexible and adapting with things as they change and and everybody's on board with that and you know we would. Yeah, have a plan for Tuesday and then it rains on Tuesday and we change the plan. That used to be what I meant by adapt and stay flexible. And then we threw this at them and we've really shaken up the way we've done business. And without very much, without very much interruption in accomplishment of their mission, they kind of stepped back, said, okay, what do we need to do and how are we going to do it? And we've asked them, for example, on a small survey boat before all this happened, uh, there would be three or four folks in a 26-foot survey boat uh, to collect data, drive the boat, act as lookout, uh, you know, process data, do all kinds of functions on this little tiny boat. Um, and then social distancing came along. Well, if you, you reach out six feet in all directions, you can't fit four people on a 26-foot boat anymore. But the mission needs to go on. So they've started working in two boat teams so there's two people on each boat and one boat surveys and the other boat conducts lookout for them and they stay in contact by the radio everybody on the team took a step back absorbed all the information which you know in the beginning was was coming in all sporadic and and a bunch of speculation about what was going to happen and we took a little pause and looked at what needed to get done and move forward so my hat's off to the entire team. The the folks that were were always the the leaders have continued to do that. But as Dennis said, there's there's been some other folks that have stepped up to the plate and kind of taken the ball and, and run with it, given this new opportunity. So the entire team has done a a spectacular job of adapting to the new normal, and I, I have no doubt that they can step up to the plate for whatever challenge comes their way. Yeah, it really doesn't surprise me either. You guys have a you have a great team, awesome people. So, um, yeah, more good news coming out of the Norfolk district uh, from what you guys are out there doing. So, I just want to thank you both for uh, for chatting with me today. And um, Scott, real quick before we before we sign off, what do you ha what what's that number for the hazards to navigation? 
Uh, that's a good question. The okay. Hazard to Navigation hotline is 757-672-1835. Okay, good. We will also put that down in the show notes for our listeners uh, to reference. All right, guys. Well, look, you continue doing awesome things. Um, stay safe and enjoy the uh, the rest of your Friday. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. All right, Thank thanks. you, Andy. We really appreciate it. Oh, thanks so much. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. 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 Yeah. So just to uh, reiterate uh, that last part of uh, that segment, um, I'm a boater, and I know there's many people who are boating in in our area throughout Virginia, as well as live on the waterways. And you know, if you happen to see something in the water that looks relatively unsafe, that it could definitely damage a, a vessel, um, but you're not sure whose uh, jurisdiction it is, whether it's the Corps or it might be uh, Virginia Marine Resources Commission or or Virginia uh, DGIF uh, Game and Inland Fisheries, uh, then you can give this phone number a call: seven five seven. Six seven two one eight three five. That is a um, a phone that our folks do do hazard navigation is their hotline, um, and that is available for you to call. And they will help uh, figure out uh, one: is it truly a hazard, and two: uh, whose jurisdiction it is to to help get that out of the waterway. Monday, May twenty fifth is Memorial Day this year. It's a federal holiday in the U.S. for honoring and mourning the military personnel that died while serving in the U.S. Armed Forces. In recognition and observance of this holiday, Patrick was able to sit down with one of our project managers for Arlington National Cemetery. So I want to take the time to welcome Rick Davis to Core Talk. Rick is uh, the Norfolk District Program Manager for Arlington National Cemetery Projects. Um, so welcome. Uh, thank you for having me. Glad to be here today. And for for the uh, the folks who are listening in, what exactly does a program manager at Arlington National Cemetery for the Norfolk District do? Um, so essentially, uh, uh, myself and a team of five project managers execute uh, project delivery for Arlington National Cemetery. Um, so we take projects from conception through planning, design, construction, and closeout um, for the cemetery to improve their facilities and uh, make the cemetery, expand the cemetery, um, closing out one project and then design for another, um, and just improving the, the operational capability of the cemetery and the visitor experience there. You kind of got into it a little bit on, on some of the projects, but what are, what are some of the main projects that we're we're working on uh, at the cemetery? Basically, we've got three categories of projects. Uh, the first one is a road reconstruction. Uh, so last year we finished one segment uh, kind of in the north part of the, the cemetery. Right now we are in the late stages of construction for um, some road networks in the southern part of the cemetery and about to award another construction project for roads kind of on the western part. And we also have a, a smaller a multiple award task order contract for roads coming up uh, so it can do mill and paving or small total reconstruction uh, to kind of finish out repairing, upgrading the road network throughout the cemetery. Uh, the second category of projects we do is uh, renovation and restoration. Uh, so right now we are in the late stages of renovating the administration building for the cemetery. That's where the executive director, superintendent, all the families that come in for, for funerals meet there before they go out for the the actual burial ceremony. Um, and also some of their other staff work out of that. Uh, so we're finishing that restoration project up. Uh, we're about ready to award uh, some restoration work for the Memorial Amphitheater next November. Uh, November 21 is the 100th anniversary of the first Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. Uh, so there's a lot of work uh, both that we are doing and that the cemetery is doing to kind of restore and upgrade uh, the amphitheater. Um, one, it needs it. It just turned 100, I think, this month. Um, and two, to get ready for that significant milestone next year. We're also kind of restoring the Orden Wetzel Gate, which is on the north end of the cemetery, um, leading to the 
Marine Corps Iwo Jima Memorial in the Netherlands Carillion. So we have that going on. We're also in the design stage for repairing some of the boundary wall, basically along the joint base Meyer Henderson Hall boundary, uh, but also in the south part a little bit. Um, so those are some upcoming restoration projects. And the, the third category is uh, cemetery expansion. Congress has given the cemetery the tasking to maintain the, the cemetery as an active cemetery um, for the foreseeable future. Um, so to do that, uh, we finished uh, Millennium Expansion, which is kind of on the northwest portion of the cemetery. And we are closing in on 65% design for Southern Expansion, which will add burial space uh, to the south of the cemetery, um, kind of adjacent to the current Air Force Memorial. And it will also relocate the cemetery's operations complex um, so that they have more contiguous uh, burial space. So that's going to be a big project, about I think, total programmed amounts, $360 million. Um, and we look to award that probably spring of 2022. Um, so a lot of work ahead to, to get ready for that project award. So a, a lot of work. And I know that in the past, we've, we've done some, some pretty... Um large items too i know that we were uh we worked on restoring the tomb of the unknowns uh as well as uh replacing and and restoring the um the the kennedy uh eternal flame uh through the years so uh our work has definitely uh started there and continuing on into the future for the cemetery um how has the relationship been uh between the uh the the district staff and the cemetery staff i think the relationship's been very good Last year, there was a huge turnover of uh, cemetery staff, um, and also I just arrived last October, uh, so kind of internally transition. But um, I think the relationship's really good. All of us from Norfolk District are, are very proud to work at the cemetery and be able to contribute to uh, the national shrine that it is. And uh, the cemetery staff have been very good to work with. Um, helping us understand kind of their unique requirements, aspects of their operations. Uh, so we work together to minimize impacts to their operations uh, while getting some very good quality projects done to help them with their operations uh, for the visitor experience and just some of their infrastructure. And I know as a, a, a former Marine myself and, and having been on the grounds there multiple times, uh, both as the tourist uh, going to see these sites as, and as a, a district employee covering uh, many of the projects that were, were there, it, it, it never ceases to uh, you know, be an extremely humbling and awe-inspiring experience. I can imagine uh, you have the, relatively uh, the, the same sort of experience that, that, that many of us do. Oh, definitely. Um, I've been to the cemetery several times in the past as a tourist, uh, but definitely look at it now in a from a different perspective, uh, being a retired army officer gives me a, a little more appreciation for it. Having a family member interred in section 13 uh, from the civil war kind of personalizes it too. So uh, no matter how frustrating things get, uh, just walking through the cemetery, seeing the, the purpose of it and, and who's there and, and what we're doing to improve the, the cemetery that makes it all worth it and very glad to be working there. And I know that right now we are in the, the, the throes of uh, um, having to social distance and, and, and uh, having to deal with the, the COVID-19 pandemic. How has that impacted how we are doing work up at the, the cemetery? In general, knock on wood, uh, really experienced very minimal impacts. Um, got two active construction projects going on right now. Uh, one, a road reconstruction. Uh, that's actually on schedule to finish early, so no real impacts to them. Um, the admin building renovation, we have seen a couple impacts uh, from the supply chain, some of the furniture, fixtures, equipment, um, and other materials to be installed. Um, are, are delayed or the manufacturers have closed down uh, due to state mandates. Um, but the, the contractors worked really, really well, finding alternate sources of suppliers uh, to be able to minimize that impact. And we've been working closely with the cemetery 
to keep them informed and to make sure some of the alternate uh, supplies and furniture is suitable. Um, so we're all working together to to overcome those those delays and workers have been uh, pretty compliant with uh, Department of Defense and cemetery guidance on wearing masks and other personal protective equipment um, and also maintaining social distancing as much as possible. It's kind of difficult working in, in the admin building, but um, I think the, the workers are protecting themselves and I'm not aware of any uh, illnesses by any of the contractors um, due to working over the last couple months. Um, actually, some of the work, especially the roads, is a little bit easier since the cemetery is closed to visitors. Um, it allows them a little more freedom to, to get it around. Um, so in, in some ways, it's been a little uh, beneficial uh, just in the amount of traffic in and around cemeteries a lot less now. Well, I want to say uh, once again, thank you for, for joining us here on, on Core Talk. Is there anything that you may want to add that I haven't, haven't asked? Uh, just for anyone listening, we are planning a an industry day at, for the cemetery, probably in the July time frame. Uh, hopefully by then, most of the travel restrictions will be, will be done with so we can have the session in person. Um, but we'll have more info out uh, through beta.sam.gov and also the district's uh, website. Uh, so stay tuned and hope to see everyone there then. And we'll have those uh, those direct links in the show notes so that you don't have to worry about writing them down. We will provide those right at the, the bottom of the screen in the podcast. So um, once again, Rick, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I know that you're extremely busy with all the work going on up there. So uh, I'll let you get back to uh, to focusing on that, but I really want to take a, a say uh, thank you so much for for taking time out of your day to join us here on Core Talk. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So now it's time for news from around the Norfolk District. The Norfolk District awarded an eleven. $0.7 million contract in April for the F-22 build-out program at Langley Air Force Base in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia. The contract covers AE design efforts for three of four projects, the $45 million consolidated ops slash maintenance hangar, a $35 million low observable component repair facility, and a $52 million training support squadron facility. A preliminary draft environmental impact statement was delivered to the Air Force for review at the end of March. The district remains on schedule to complete the final EIS in December with a construction contract award the following summer. This project is a top priority for the Air Force in relocating a fleet of F-22 Raptors to Langley from Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida. The New York and New Jersey Harbor Anchorages has reached a key milestone. Lieutenant General Todd Semonite, the Army Corps of Engineers Commanding General, signed a Chief's Report late last month recommending the study's findings for authorization by Congress. Norfolk District led the two-year comprehensive study, but it was a joint court that included New York and Mobile Districts. The project provides an anchorage for the large vessels using the harbor by widening and deepening Gravesend Anchorage. This will reduce navigation inefficiencies and transportation costs. And finally, renourishment work at Sandbridge Beach continues and is on track for completion by May 23rd. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, Great Lakes Dredge and Dock, the Norfolk District contractor, is only allowing critical personnel on Dredge during sand borrow and placement operations. The company also requires a 14-day quarantine before crews are allowed to mobilize. You can find all these stories and more on our website and social media channels. And that's what's happening around the Norfolk District. Until next time. This is Core Talk. Core Talk is the official podcast of the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Submitting emails or voicemails to Core Talk constitutes permission to use that content as part of the broadcast. Core Talk is recorded at the Norfolk District Headquarters building in Norfolk, Virginia, and is produced by the District's public affairs staff. 